Hello everybody and welcome back. We are going to have our week three and week four lecture combined today. I hope that you found week one and two have been a pretty smooth sailing for you and that you have gathered some new tools that you'll be taking into your uh, portfolio two class but even well beyond into your later uh, classes. So here we are on the FSO dashboard where we start and this week we're going to be focusing on creating your survey. So you're going to start thinking to yourself about uh, maybe business ideas that you have or um, if you are more of a blogger how you would use a survey to um, address issues within your written works if you're a YouTuber and actually I, I had a student that was a YouTuber um, he still is actually he does quite well and he has a gaming channel um, and he used the survey during this time to address some um, content issues that he was having for uh, future uh, video creations and so he was able to use the information from the survey uh, to in a real-world capacity address these issues which you know that's fantastic so uh, I want you to think about that um, while you're going through these assignments. So we have two written works um, that we uh, have in RMC and this will be one of them that will require you to do your due diligence with research, make sure you use Evernote for your organization, um, and you're going to go through the process of um, researching what a survey is and how to write a good one. So that being said, let's talk about that for a minute. So good surveys have a lot of components to them. And the first thing that you need to think about is what makes you take a survey? What's a really good survey? One that doesn't make you abandon it, one that doesn't make you frustrated, one that you're actually willing to take. Um, if you create a good survey, you're gonna have higher response rates. Um, the data that you get will be much higher quality. Um, and as long as they're easy to fill out, you'll find that most people are willing to partake in your survey. So at the beginning of this, think about what I just said about, you know, you kind of have beginning to have a nebulous idea of what you may create your survey on. Um, you know, and it could be a make-believe idea. That's perfectly okay. Um, but if you choose to do that, you still have to have a very focused objective. And that means, for instance, um, the, the person that I was referring to earlier that has the YouTube channel, um, he was trying to find out if there was a specific game that um, his viewers would want him to do a video on. That's a very clear objective. Um, do you want video creation for this game um, and would you watch it? So that gives um, the good objective and then he shared, you know, the goal of the survey for him was, you know, once he found out the interest level, if it was high enough, he would create uh, the survey to address this particular game. So that covers the goal of the survey, the objectives. Here, why are you creating the survey? Well, in here you're creating it uh, to practice your skills at doing research and using an instrument to gather data. Um, if you were doing it out in the workforce, you could do it if, if you were working in HR. You could be finding out information from the employees at the company um, to implement, implement new policies. Um, if you're working as, uh, you know, somebody who uh, is at a newsroom. <laughs> that, that example was not coming to me easily. Um, uh, one of our students, I think I mentioned in a previous lecture, works in a newsroom, and he found himself suddenly doing market surveys to find out who to target um, the specific programming to in the area. And, you know, when he's developing that survey, you know, what he wants to accomplish with that survey is to find out specifically where they need to target uh, their advertising so that, you know, they draw in more clientele. And finally, how will you use the data that you're collecting? Um, in this class, you're going to use this data to create a research report um, that will be the culminating um, cap to all of your research, but that's going to be created in Portfolio 2. You're learning all of the parts of creating a research report and a research project in research, and then you're using the the time in Portfolio 2 to put the cap on it, to give the final presentation. And I will show you a few examples of what those look like uh, before we're done here today. 
Okay, so think about surveys you've taken in the past. Now, most surveys that I take, once they're over 10 questions, forget it. Um, I'm just, I'm not that interested in any one product or any one um, idea uh, to really sit down and put my time and effort into a survey um, that's super long. Um, for instance, there's one that my school district puts out for my children, and that thing is 50 questions long. I mean, it's horribly put together, too. So, of course, the whole time I'm, you know, <laughs> editing it and saying, oh, not a great way to answer a question. Um, and I will admit that I do actually take that one survey that's way too long just because I know it directly influences what happens with the kids in their school. Uh, but for the most part, I think most of us agree that 50 questions is way, way too long to ask people to um, jump into a survey and help you with responses. Um, you want to stick to a single objective. You don't want to, if you're opening a chocolate shop you don't, and you want to know, you're trying to figure out what should be on the menu. That's your objective. What items do you want to see on the menu? You don't want to ask them, what items do you want to see on the menu? What location should it be in? What should my hours be? You want to stick to that one specific objective. Uh, the shorter the survey, the higher the response rate. And that's very interesting. We've noticed a lot of companies lately are doing two to three question surveys. Or if you even noticed on YouTube, Sometimes instead of an ad now, they'll ask you to take a survey question. And if you think about the millions of people that that reaches, um, that's quite a broad sample uh, of people because one to two questions asked over that many people, you're going to get a high rate of response. Make sure your questions get to the point and avoid the use of jargon. So what does that mean? So here's a great example. The other day in our live class, um, we had to meet to see a guest lecturer. And I was trying to tell the kids uh, in the class where to go to see the lecturer, and I gave them the wrong location. And so they texted me, and they're like, where is this? And I said, in the fishbowl. And two or three of them texted back and said, what are you talking about? What is the fishbowl? I knew what the fishbowl. Most students at Full Sail know what the fishbowl is. But here, these newer students, they had no idea what my jargon meant at that point. Um, you know, they hadn't been there long enough to learn the ins and outs and the nicknames of certain places around Full Sail. And the same is true in business. You know, you may find that you have acronyms for things that are commonly understood within your profession, but if you push the survey out, they may not understand what you're talking about. So try to avoid the use of jargon. And again, make your, your questions specific and direct as possible. You can do that in a few ways. So using closed-ended questions whenever possible. Um, yes, no, that is a, a wonderful way to get quantitative data. Um, that gives you a good statistical result, uh, easy to calculate. You know, you don't have to go through and find themes or um, do any, um, you know, in-depth analysis on what the different opinions are. Those are direct and easy. Um, Close-ended questions can be yes, no, they can be true, false, you can be a multiple choice, it could be a, a Likert scale or a rating scale, you've seen those, they're the kind that say, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, please rate where, you know, you fall in this category. And rating scales are great because if you think about when you're creating the survey, they get to be a little tedious when they're just multiple choice. Um, or they're just yes or no. So if you can throw a rating scale in there too to kind of, you know, break the monotony of the questions, that helps a lot. Um, also, they're pretty, they're a pretty easy way to, um, you know, keep things consistent throughout the survey. So meaning if you're going to say um, on a scale of 1 to 10, make sure every time you do a rating, you do 1 to 10. You don't, you know, deviate 1 to 5, 1 to 10, 1 to 20. In my personal opinion, I keep it at one to five because I feel like there's this weird level of emotion you're supposed to feel between six and ten or four and one. Um, I either feel like you're either over the top about something, you have a good feeling about something, you have absolutely no care or idea what you're talking about, and then the reverse on the other side. So for me, I keep it one to five just to keep things simple. Uh, make sure you always use an odd number because you do not want to have to deal with the data analysis um, that makes it so much easier.
Okay, make sure your question flows in a logical order. So what that means is don't start out by saying, um, are you male or female? Should I have a chocolate shop? Um, what is your gender? Uh, what things should I serve in the chocolate shop? Um, in what location do you live? You know, make sure that it flows logically. If you're asking, um, you know, questions that deal with certain items in the chocolate shop again, um, make and they're food related. Do the do the food related ones, and then you can move on to the uh, questions about age or male or female. If that's something that you even need to ask, it's not necessary for every um, survey. So collect demographic data and ask any sensitive questions at the end. Now this is interesting because um, a lot of the times you find that stuff at the beginning, but all of the literature supports that you ask it at the end. And the reasoning is they they have concluded that people don't like to give up personal information. And so if you have to ask personal information um, and you put it at the end, if people have already answered a few of the questions, sometimes they'll have a buy-in to the survey, especially if it's not too long. Um, and they'll be w more willing to answer those questions at the end. Um, if you have them at the get beginning and that's something that bothers people, they may not even agree to take your, to take your survey in the first place. Okay, this is huge. Make sure you pretest your survey with somebody else. You want to make sure you don't have any um, grammatical errors, misspellings. Um, you know, this is going out to the public. This is your face that's going out there. Also, there may be questions that are asked in a way that make complete sense to you, and you're not catching that they're not understandable to other people. So make sure that you give it to somebody else and have them look at it and, you know, give you an idea that it's an easy to take survey. So this is just an interesting fun fact. So if you consider your audience when sending your survey invitation, when you're looking at your sample that you're targeting, um, statistics show the highest open and click rates take place on Monday, Friday, and Sunday. And I bet if you take a second to think about it, you're going to easily come up with why. So Monday is that day at work when everybody really doesn't want to get started, right? <laughs> and so a lot of people do a lot of clicking on social media or clicking, checking their email, and they may just be using that as a way to put off what they have to get started. And usually by Friday, you're done with all your work. And sometimes, you know, people may find themselves bored or, you know, need to kind of kill a few more hours before the day's done. So you get more rate that way. And Sunday just tends to be the lazy day, right? That's when a lot of people find themselves just in front of the computer and, and you know, just browsing away a couple of hours. And interestingly enough, the quality of the survey responses don't vary from week weekday to weekend. They tend to stay pretty consistent depend, even, even on those days. For your survey, your survey this week will go out on Thursday well, you'll create it on Thursday. You may want to do it on Friday. I take that back. Um, create it on Thursday, on Friday, after you've um, gotten your feedback and you see, you know, if there's any recommendations for edits or anything, you want to send this survey out. So you have to get 100 respondents on your survey uh, before you get into Portfolio 2. And you guys have all had Roxanne. She's no joke. Um, she's going to check and make sure that you've posted your survey in the full sale group. And I'll show you, uh, where that is in a second. Um, and she's going to ask you <laughs> if you've gotten those hundred response respondents. Um, and she's going to push you to do it more in that week of port two, if you don't have them and it'd be much better to get them done over these next two weeks, um, as opposed to having to do it then. Uh, so during this week, that'll go out and then, about midweek of week four, look and see how your response rate's coming along. And if it needs a push, push it out again. Um, and, you know, encourage people, let them know that you are a, a student who needs survey responses. Um, there's been a few creative uh, ways that students have gone about doing this in the past. Some people, if their area of interest has a lot of Facebook pages or groups devoted to uh, the topic that they're discussing, um, they've contacted the admins and explained that they're a student and would it be possible to post the survey on their page. And, you know, more often than not, they get a yes. Um, also, one of my students one time, and this was fantastic, I never would have thought of this. Um, she was doing a her survey research report on um, online amphibian and reptile uh, retail store. 
you know, if that, if that was a thing, if people would use it. And apparently on Craigslist, that's, you know, one of the huge categories um, of for sale things. So she posted the survey in the Craigslist uh, area for that. And she actually got about 25 responses. And that is really thinking outside of the box. I don't know that I would have thought of Craigslist as a as a place to post it. But, you know, think like that. Think of, you know, where can I put this to get the most respondents? Now, and I'll take you, again, I'll take you to look at SurveyMonkey in a minute, and that's the tool that we're going to use. Um, but SurveyMonkey only allows for 100 respondents. Now, I do know that you could create a, a survey in Google Forms and, um, and other platforms that allow for more, but I was looking for something that was free and easy to use for the first time you were uh, creating an instrument uh, so that you could gather data. So unfortunately, if you get over 100, it will tell you that you have over 100, but um, without paying for it, and please do not pay for it, um, you're only going to get the response for 100. Um, incentives typically boost response rates by 50%. Um, why? Well, think about it like when you go into the mall and the people stop you and they say, um, you know, will you mind coming and taking this really quick survey? I'll give you a gift certificate to Chick-fil-A right? Suddenly you have lunch <laughs> and you weren't expecting it. So, um, you know, as long as it's appropriate in scope, it kind of matches, you know, your output um, to what they're giving you. Um, incentives really do um, help people kind of want to take your survey a little bit more than just the asking. Now, I know that you're probably not going to have a chance to offer any incentives, but keep that tidbit in your back pocket for, for later uh, in your work lives. Okay. <laughs> and my last thing that I like to go, make sure that your surveys, whatever you are um, gathering data for, or whatever you say is going to be the end result of your survey. You're, you say that we're going to do this survey, and when we're finished, this is going to be what's happened. Make sure that you stick to that. Um, this is one of my favorite stories. This um, Antarctic research ship uh, from Canada, uh, they put out a huge call, help us name the boat. Help us name this boat, we're going to name it the top names. And you can imagine the kind of information and um, d people that sent stuff in. And of course, Reddit got a hold of it. And um, Bodie McBoatface got to the very top. They even crashed the servers. And so Bodie, Bodie McBoatface, for clear win, and in the end, they couldn't bring themselves to do it. They did not name this boat Bodie McBoatface, which is a farce, and I'm still upset about it. Now they did, um, they did give a, a, you know, a little help. They named one of their subs the the deep diving subs that goes on the boat Bodie McBoatface. But I argue that is neither a boat nor is that the original name of that sub. But I know that's just me. <laughs> All right, so let's go look at where you're going to be creating your survey. Um, I'm gonna just here, again, this is just written work um, before I jump into um, putting together your survey questions and looking at SurveyMonkey. I just want you to um, notice a few things. This is written as a paper, 400 to 600 words in length. Have somebody edit it for you. Leave feedback, two ideas or suggestions for two classmates. That is 20 points off your grade if there is not feedback there. So make sure that you don't forget to um, include that in your, in your submission. Okay, so creating your survey. So we're going to use SurveyMonkey to create a survey. And SurveyMonkey um, is, is fairly easy to use. You'll have to sign up for the free service and then you'll click create a survey. All right, and we're just going to go ahead and start from scratch, and we'll call it new survey, and maybe it won't yell at me for having done that a few times, and we'll education, and we will say create survey. If you've already written your questions, you can pull them in, and it'll try to see if there's anything matching, um, but since we're starting here, we're just going to go ahead and um, start from scratch. So here it says add title page. This is where you're going to put... Um, a description of your survey. This is where you put the summary. Remember how I talked about it? it needs to be clear, concise. You need to tell everybody 
what this survey is, what it's going to do, and what you're going to do with the results. That should go here. Um, and, oh, nation. Okay. I know. Of course, I'm on here when I'm spelling it wrong. Information goes here. Okay. And we're going to save that. Now, that's going to show up as a summary um, when your survey pops up. So now we get to begin asking questions. So here is the new question. So we're going to click new question and it's going to automatically take us to multiple choice. Now that doesn't mean that has to be our first question, um, but that's where it brings us. So we could click the down bar and then we have a lot more um, choices for the types of questions. So for the first question, let's say that I do need to know people's age. Um, so we can say, what is your age? And look, it's a pretty common question. So if you click that, um, it's going to go ahead and pre-fill it for you. Now let's say I need something even lower than 18 to 24. I would say edit, and it's going to give me the opportunity to add. We're going to add here. Now I believe we can move it up um, after we do this. So we can say 17, um, let's say... 15 through 17. Uh, click, I think we can click it. I forgot how we can move it up. I know that you can, oh, let's save it. And oh, I think I have to do it and edit. Sorry, we're going the long way around this. Oh, maybe you can't move it around. Um, I felt like we could, but I'm not seeing how to do it. You can play around with that, and if that's something that you can do, feel free to add it. Um, you may just have to add and then do 18 to 24, and then jump up here to 16 through 17. I feel like you should be able to move the questions around, and like I've done that before, but right now it's not coming to me. But you can play around with that and see. So here's our first question. What is your age? So let's say we want to do our next question, and this time we want to do a star rating question. So we're going to click the, the star rating, scale one to five, because you guys know I like that. Um, and here's the color. We're going to add rating labels. So we're going to say one star is, I hate it. Second one is, eh. Third one, I don't have an opinion. Oh, good, it changed it for me. Um, good and best thing ever. Okay, so here's our star ratings and let's see how it turns out. Um, oh, I forgot to put my question in. <laughs> it does help to put a question um, on a scale of one through five. How much do you like Pepsi? Okay. All right, let's try again and see if it yells at us. All right, there we go. So now they can just choose whichever one they like. Pretty good, huh? Okay, so anyway, when you're formulating your questions, I would write them all out first somewhere else and then come in here and decide how you want to put them in. When you're done, you can preview and test, and it'll show you what it looks like, which is kind of nice. There you go. Um, and we'll X out of there and we can go to next. And how do you want to collect responses? Um, you know, you're, you're just going to get a web link so that you can share that on FSO and out to the world. And there you go. There's the link that you can put out for people to take and put on FSO. Now the nice thing about this is, do you see where it says analyze results? Once you have respondents, this is actually going to visualize the results for you. Um, so you know how we talked about the infographics and we talked about um, digital design and you know information design? Um, this is the same kind of idea. It's going to take your data and it's going to put it into graphic form for you. Now you won't be able to use those exact graphics in your final project later but you can certainly use representations of those graphics. Um, so you'll definitely um, want to keep those as an example so you kind of have an idea of what that looks like in the end. 
So here's the Facebook page that I was talking about. Hopefully by now you guys have all joined the MCBS at Full Sail Closed Group. This is a closed group for MCBS students only. Um, if I get, sometimes when people search MCBS, this pops up and they ask to be admitted. Um, and so I have to send them a message and say, well, are you a, a bachelor student? Um, if not, then this isn't the group for you. Go to our main page. But this is the group for you. Um, and everybody here, for the most part, has had to do one of these surveys. So you have an audience that's receptive to taking your survey. Um, you know, if they, if they fit within your sample. Uh, so definitely make sure you post here and then think of other avenues. Think about when you did the Remy um, assignment and you had to research social media platforms and what the best social media platforms were for distributing information. You already see, you already did the research. Um, and think about which ones you should use to try to get your survey link out for your 100 respondents. When we're conducting a survey, we like to make sure we're asking questions that will collect accurate and useful information. But it isn't always obvious what makes a survey question a good survey question. Here are seven tips that can help in developing good survey questions. One, a good question is one where all respondents interpret the question in a consistent manner. That's not always easy to achieve. The question, have you ever been the victim of a serious crime, might be interpreted differently by different people. Is getting your car stolen a serious crime? Probably. What about your bicycle? What about your skateboard? Make sure your questions are as clear and as specific as possible. Two, a good question is also one where people are willing to answer the question. If a survey asks about very personal things such as sexual behavior or drug use, you might find lots of people unwilling to answer such questions. If you need to ask personal questions, you need to craft those questions carefully and explain to the respondent why you need this information and assure them that you'll keep their responses confidential or even anonymous. Three, a good question is one that a respondent will answer truthfully. Let's take the following question as an example. Do you own a library card? Seems clear enough, and it doesn't seem too personal, but surprisingly, lots of respondents might say yes even when they don't have a library card. Why is that? It's something called social desirability. Reading books, being well-read, is socially desirable. So someone who never goes to the library might not want to admit that they don't have a library card for fear that they might be judged negatively. It might be better to ask the question this way. Some people get books from a library. Others buy them from bookstores or online. Do you currently have a library card or not? That might sound a little awkward, but you're more likely to get a more truthful answer. Four. A good question is one that a respondent can actually answer. If you ask someone how much money they spend on groceries in an average month, you might be surprised how many people would say they weren't sure. Make sure people have the knowledge or information to answer your survey question. Five, avoid double-barreled questions. These are questions that ask for a single answer to a question that really has two different parts. For example, let's say you are asked the following question. Do you believe the United States should spend more money on education and less money locking up nonviolent criminals? That's a double-barreled question. Respondents who agree with one part but not the other will have trouble answering this question. You should break that question into two separate questions. Six, avoid biased terms or wording. This is probably the hardest thing to do when writing questions. Should you use the term Obamacare or use the Affordable Care Act? Should you use the term welfare? or should you say assistance to the poor? It isn't obvious which is the better terminology, but different terms will likely lead to different answers. Surveys will sometimes give one question to half the sample and a slightly different worded question to another half to see how respondents react to the different wording. Seven, pre-test your questions. This is the most important tip. You need to try out your questions on real people and then ask for feedback. Were they confused by a question? Did they answer in a way that surprised you? Pre-testing will help you find out if you have any problems with your questions. Of course, there's no such thing as a perfect survey question. Instead, our goal is to create questions that elicit meaningful responses. Surveys take time and money. We don't want to waste our time and the respondent's time asking bad questions. 
Following these seven tips can help you craft clear and useful survey questions. So there's a lot more to creating survey questions than I bet a lot of you even ever thought. Um, if you if you think about, you know, you, you just think that you're asking questions to get this information, but there's a real design element to how you uh, go about designing the survey questions so that you get real actionable data from it that you can use um, for the purposes of the survey. Um, so for this video we're going to watch, this talks a little bit more about the analysis of the data that you uh, receive from your survey. And this is a sophomore level course and we're just getting our, our feet wet playing with the uh, survey instrument and learning the ins and outs of creating them. Um, you know, we're not, we're not um, a business intelligence class where you have to get uh, into you know, real in-depth statistical analysis uh, with descriptive statistics or, you know, things of that nature. But it certainly doesn't hurt to be introduced to the concepts of what happens with the data once you have gathered your survey. So some of this may be uh, just questions on Jeopardy for you to answer at the end, uh, but it's good information to hear uh, from these market researchers. The principal goal of surveys is to inform and simplify the world around us by giving us key pieces of information. Somewhat ironically, that goal of simplification involves many complicated steps. Join me and we'll walk through 10 steps in conducting surveys. Keep in mind that these steps are broad brushstrokes. They're easy to describe, but often hard to execute. Step one, know your population. In their most basic form, surveys are a tool to represent a broader group. You have to decide that group and your reason for studying them early on. Are you interested in an entire country, a region, or a rare population of certain individuals? Step two, determine a mode. Will your survey be face-to-face, -face, online, mail, or telephone? No survey mode is perfect for all scenarios. You have to choose the mode carefully in light of your needs and resources. Step three, create a questionnaire. Surveys need questions. No brainer, huh? In practice, writing good questions requires painstaking consideration. Step four, test your questionnaire. So you think you wrote awesome questions, huh? Well, when I sing in the shower, I think I could tour with Conway Twitty. Hello, darling. All survey questions should be pre-tested either by focus groups, cognitive interviewing, split ballot experiments, field pre-testing, or some other method. Step five, get a good sample. Sampling is the magic of surveys. Your sample consists of the people you are trying to interview. A great questionnaire will yield a junk survey with a bad sample. Step six, collect the data. This is where we find more tricky bits. Collecting data ultimately involves making phone calls, knocking on doors, posting HTML, or mailing paper. Data collection must be rigorous, documented, and consistent. Step seven, organize and clean the data. Suppose you did a telephone survey with a caddy system. You just got a data set that looks like a messy spreadsheet with questions in strange orders scattered across multiple columns. You also probably have many pieces of information that need to be rescaled and renumbered precisely and accurately. This is also a good time to calculate response rates, a quality measure consisting of the number of completed interviews divided by the valid sample. Step eight. Weight the data. Now, even if you did everything perfectly up to this step, your final sample of respondents probably won't perfectly match the population. Post-stratification weighting will now help you to correct many known imbalances. Step nine, analyze the data. Ain't nobody got time for that fancy spreadsheet. Survey analysis is fascinating, addictive, and extremely useful. You want to present question order, wording, and basic descriptive statistics by creating a top-line report. Then you might want to explore subpopulations with crosstabs. You might even poke at causal relationships using regression. Graphics are cool too. Step 10. Present the results. If you conducted a good survey, you just spent a lot of money to share valuable information with important people. You now need to communicate your results to your audience in a way that is accessible and interesting. Finally. Give someone a high five because you've just gone through the process of a survey. Now let's do a quick review of those 10 steps. Step one, know your population. Step two, determine a mode. Step three, create a questionnaire. Step four, test your questionnaire. 
Step five, get a good sample. Step six, collect the data. Step seven, organize and clean the data. Step eight, weight the data. Step nine, analyze the data. And step 10, present the results. 10 steps, survey excellence. Okay, so like I said, there's a lot more that goes into the creation of a survey than a lot of people actually think about when they begin the development of um, this particular tool. So now I want to show you uh, a couple examples of what happens when you get into uh, Portfolio 2 with all of this information. So, you know, you've visualized data, you've written analysis, um, and you have learned how to put forth the survey questions. So I'm going to show you two examples of uh, a final research report, and we'll look at how it all comes together. Let's hide the sidebar, and let's make it big. All right, so this particular uh, research report was created with the question, the objective was, should Full Sail University have a dining hall? We don't have one. Um, and so the idea behind it was to collect the data from the students at Full Sail and then actually present it to somebody and say, you know, if the results showed that, yes, it was, uh, you know, conclusive that there should be a dining hall, that there was interest in it, or if not, then, you know, that it may not be a need. I do want you to notice here yet again, um, the same that I talk about with your presentations um, previously, you're going to have to pull together the tools that you learned in aesthetics, your former presentations, just this time you're actually putting it in a digital design. So, dining hall. So here we go. You can see that, you know, the theme has already been laid out. We have the, the utensils, we have the plates as page holders um, and to represent, you know, each of the pages that are coming up. Uh, you start with the research summary. Why are you doing this research and what are you going to do with this research? Uh, you then move on to the strategy. Here she chose to push it out on Facebook uh, to get respondents from full sale students. And here are the questions. So, are you a full sale student or staff of Full Sail University? So, here she's visualized the responses and given a small summary of what that information led to after the survey results came back. And she did a 10 question survey and you can see that each graphic is a little bit different. Um, they're dynamic graphics, they're not boring to look at. Um, you'll also notice that at the footer, um, she's kept that same consistent theme and the page changes on the uh, little spoon, <laughs> which I think is a great touch. All right, so here are all the questions. And then at the end, you do a final analysis of all the data, uh, not to the extent of the video that we just saw. Because again, we're not business intelligence students. We're just sophomore students that are learning how to you know, create one of these for the first time. But you can, at this point, say, this is what I thought was going to happen. This is what I, I did. This is what did happen. And now this is my recommendation. So that's one example of a research report. And I'll show you one more. So this was um, a research report where the question was, do we need a, uh, an app that will allow us to check our grades, interact with um, uh, the professors at, at Full Sail, you know, um, just something more serviceable than anything they had in the past. Now with the new FSO, you can actually do all of this on the phone, which kind of makes this obsolete. But at the time, there wasn't any place where you could message your professor or see your grades or do anything on a mobile. So here's the problem. He's talking about that being the issue. Uh, he talks here about addressing those needs. Um, here is the idea he has, the mobile application that I just talked about. Um, and then here he presents it. This is what he wants to create, this Full Sail Nation University mobile application. And again, you'll see we're going through each of the questions. It's visualized. There's a small summary of what the question results uh, gave him. And a final analysis. So um, it's pretty easy. And like I said, you've gone through all of the steps through research, um, visualizing the data, doing analysis, um, and working with the survey. So by the time you get to port two, it's really just putting it all together in a professional way.
Okay, so I just want to wrap up with reminding you that you'll need to have the survey created. Uh, you'll submit it on Thursday, uh, get your feedback, and then it'll be ready to publish and push out to everybody so you can get your respondents. Okay, so I want to move on to week four. We're going to cover that in today's episode of lecture in RMC. Um, and week four, we're going to start with SEO fundamentals. Now, in RMC, the goal of uh, the introduction of SEO, which is search engine optimization, is to familiarize you with the concept because later in the program, you're going to deal with this um, as, as part of your, your website building classes, your entrepreneurship classes, um, and, and you're going to tackle how to utilize SEO um, for yourself uh, when you're creating those types of, of, of assets. Um, so that being said, let's learn a little bit about SEO. The best place to hide a body is the second page of Google. Hey everybody, this is Owen at thevideospot.net and today we're gonna to be answering a very basic question, what is SEO? And more importantly, why it's so important for your business. SEO is one of a couple different internet marketing strategies that are pivotal for your business to have success online. And what we're gonna go through today is defining a couple terms that'll help you to understand what SEO is. And then I'm gonna connect you to a couple different videos that'll help you to continue your education. SEO stands for search engine optimization. And it's the process of enhancing your website so that it can be found on search engines like Google, Yahoo, Bing, and YouTube. Now, we're really only gonna focus on Google and YouTube here because together, those two search engines account for 67.5% of all searches that happen in the world. Most of that being in the United States, of course. Bing trails behind them at 18.4, and Yahoo is only capturing 10.3% of all web searches. So we're gonna focus on getting ranked in Google because that's where you're gonna get massive results. Now, people who do SEO or SEO consultants are also called SEOs. So you might hear that term kind of intermix around as well. Google processes 3.5 billion searches every single day from people who are looking for answers to questions like who shot Lincoln and where do I find a good web designer in San Diego? Your goal with SEO is to optimize your website so that when people are searching for terms relevant to your business, your website is more likely to appear on the search engine ranking pages, also called the SERPs. Your job as a business owner or a web designer is to optimize your website, and that's just a fancy word meaning enhance or make a couple tweaks to your website so that if you're selling products, providing a local service, or answering questions on a blog, your results are being found and they're being found on top of the search engine ranking pages. And through this series, over the next couple weeks, I'm gonna show you exactly what you need to do to get there. So be sure to subscribe to my channel. Now in the SEO category, there's typically two other different types of SEO. There's local SEO. And local SEO is designed for a local service provider to be found when keyword modifiers are used like San Diego, Oceanside, Del Mar, Carlsbad, or areas that that service provider can, can provide service to, right? Where video SEO is a slightly different but very similar process of making sure that the videos that you create show up in a Google search engine ranking as well. It's the objective of this video to be found when you type in the keywords, what is SEO or a similar type keyword. So if that's how you found me, please let me know in the comments below. That'd be super awesome. I wanna know if it's working. Now the process of doing SEO is not incredibly difficult, but it's very time consuming and it's research heavy. Inherently what SEO is, is matching up your website content with the words and phrases that other people are using when they type in to Google. So you wanna do what's called keyword research. So if you're a painter in San Diego, you might think that people are searching for how do I find a painter in San Diego? When in reality, people might be typing in something like best painter San Diego. 
See, you want to know what people are typing in so you can create pages in your website that use those exact phrases and that will tell Google that your website is relevant to that search and it will help you get ranked for searches that are very similar. That's inherently the process of SEO. Now there's another back-end process to SEO that we call off-page SEO. Off-page SEO is the process of getting other websites to link back to your website, inherently saying, hey, if you're looking for this type of service, if you're looking for the best painter in San Diego, you should go to this website because they're all about finding the best painter in San Diego. You're also gonna wanna leverage YouTube videos and get your videos to link back to your website. And you're also gonna wanna form relationships with other website owners that are willing and able to link back to you and provide your website with a little bit more buoyancy so that you're found on the top of the search engine ranking pages. Once you're ranking, you want people to click on your website and that's more like search engine marketing and we're gonna get into that in a future video so be sure to subscribe. So there's definitely a research element that's in SEO. Um, but our, our objective for um, going through this SEO process this week is just to learn um, why you use it, how you use it, and how it's going to be useful for you in the future. Um, this is another Linda, and this week it's going to focus on the fundamentals of S SEO, and it's a little bit longer than uh, your other two. So make sure you take a look at the due date for this. It's later in the week. But that's to give you time to thoroughly watch all of it um, so that, you know, you don't run out of time and get stuck trying to watch three hours of SEO fundamentals before the deadline is due. Okay, and finally for this week in week four, um, we're going to be wrapping everything up um, with our visualization of data and talking about making sense out of it. Um, here, you're going to learn about data manipulation. Remember we talked about ethics? Here, they're going to talk about how people can manipulate data um, visually to not give a full and complete picture of what the information is that's being presented. So you guys will watch Making Sense Out of Mountains of Data. And again, this is going to be your second piece of written work. So make sure after you review um, the, the video and you come down here and you see the prompts that you... Uh, write this in an essay format. Every once in a while I'll have somebody that just puts a, a bullet and an answer, bullet and the answer. That is not the, the case here. Also, don't forget to cite this as the source. Granted, you only have one source here and you're more than welcome to go out and do more research if you want and include that in your writing, um, but you're only required to have this one source of data here. Uh, I just want to point out here too, um, I'm just asking you to play with, as you saw in the research reports earlier, uh, there's going to have to be some graphical representation of your data. And because of that, I'm just having you play with this. It's a very simple thing. You're going to take the information that says in each of these graphs and you're going to make an alternate graph. So it means don't make a bar chart, don't make a pie graph, do something different, uh, but represent this data. I have noticed that um, FSO uh, has been a little bit cranky about allowing you to put the graphic within the essay response you know, fun times, right? Um, so you're more than welcome to just add the graphic as feedback below. Okay, so that wraps up the week, um, except for you will have your RISE review, but you guys are used to those by now. Um, and so make sure you do this in essay format, uh, make sure you have somebody read it and edit it. Um, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask.